Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee started in 1981. So this was a period when the Arab community was coming into its own, was maturing, was growing, was trying to, trying to speak for itself, was working to represent itself. I need the glasses to turn, that's my alarm. Um, so I'll get there very quickly. So all this growth and change led to all sorts of revolutions that happened within the Arab community too. So the new people who came to America were like Sheikh Shinri had been when he first came, you know, 20 years beforehand. They were disturbed by the American Arabs and American Muslims that they saw. Those people seemed looked really American to them. Not quite Muslim enough, not quite Arab enough. What happened? Why did these young people not speak Arabic? What's going on here in America? And so they had, they were sort of frustrated. A lot of their frustration they took out on the mosques. The American Muslim Society, again, as most of you know, was taken over by the Yemeni community, by the Palestinian community. They banged on the door because in the old days, the holidays were celebrated on Saturday. They weren't celebrated on the day that Eid fell. People didn't get off work on the day that Eid fell. They had, uh, their main sermons were on Sunday morning because people had to work on Fridays. They would go to the mosque after work on Friday. But these new people said, no, we're going to pray on Eid. It doesn't count if we pray on some other day. So they broke down the door of the mosque went in and started praying. And this led to this new revolution. The Yemeni community took over the mosque. And here they are. They really made the mosque grow. It grew. Now it's like really probably a bigger congregation than at the Islamic Center of America. It's a huge, really important, very influential mosque in, in the whole Michigan area. They also work really closely with the African American community. And they still do. Um, so, as the Yemenis the Palestinians moved into the South End, a lot of the Lebanese moved out because the Lebanese at this point had been here a long, long time and they had resources. Their kids didn't want to live in the South End anymore. They wanted to live over in the, the other parts of East Dearborn. They wanted to move to West Dearborn. They wanted to move to more Northville. So the community started moving out of that old occupational niche too. The Ford Motor Company, the jobs that had the good jobs were in engineering. They weren't on the line anymore. The community was getting educated. It was opening grocery stores and gas stations and making money. And so the community really transformed itself. So here's a picture that was taken at the East Dearborn Arab Festival, which we all know no longer exists a few years ago. But I love it because that's, that's the Dearborn we know today, right? A happy Dearborn. Uh, the Arab American Museum, which we're sitting in, opened in 2005. And most of America was thinking that Arabs were all going to have to go home after 9-11. But this community didn't go home. This community invested in itself really, really invested in itself. And a lot of the liberal establishment of America invested in it too. This museum cost $14 million to build, and the Arab community probably gave a third. <coughs> the Ford Motor Company, GM, the Ford Foundation, the Michigan, the state of Michigan, all these other people supported the museum too. The Islamic Center of America, they opened their brand new building in the same week. It was very exciting to be, to be able to go back and forth to those two events. Uh, we have, you know, Shatila is probably, if you talk to Arabs in other parts of America and you say the word Dearborn, the next thing they say is Shatila. <laughs> you probably all know this. It's a great, thriving business. But we've got, you know, the old Berry Halal Meat place from the south end of Dearborn. We've got cell phone companies, even Walmart in Dearborn, of course, now has Arabic products and Arabic speakers. We've got fancy... Uh, you know, I love the picture of Brome. Brome is that hamburger joint on the west side of town. Look at it, it's a hipster, cool joint. They tell you where their beef come from, so they tell you where their tomatoes come from. They don't tell you that their burgers are halal. Nowhere on the sign does it say it's halal. Whereas over in this end of Dearborn, we had that strip club a few doors down a few years ago that said halal chicken on the roof of the strip club. So Dearborn, to me, sort of exists between these two worlds, you know? That's Dearborn. That's the Dearborn we know. Uh, we've had a lot of elected officials and appointed officials come out of Dearborn, come out of the, you know, maybe literally, I know Rashida lives in Detroit, not in Dearborn, but she's a part of this community. Uh, I, I knew her grandmother back in the day. Ish Ahmed was, had a, had a, was the head of the Health and Human Services for the state. So in particular now it's becoming, it used to be we had a senator, an Arab American senator who was a Republican, that's becoming more and more scarce now. If Arabs want to succeed in the political establishment, they do it these days through the Democratic Party. Now we have an Arab majority on our city council. I know that slide's a little bit out of date. 
Uh, I love the fact that when the Arab majority, the first sort of vote they had to make, the, the big highly publicized vote was on the question of the garages, of whether people could have the sliding glass doors on their garages or not. I love the fact that that's the controversy of Dearborn. It's not, as America looks at us and thinks about Sharia law, this is what the government's actually doing. Um, and we have all sorts of innovations in terms of like, you know, this is the south end of Dearborn, this is the Dix Mosque. They got tired of doing fundraisers for their mosque all the time, so they built the mosque, built this huge medical facility, brought in doctors and clinicians to rent the medical facility, and now it's like a traditional walk. The mosque runs off the income they make from the walk. It's a great, it's a great idea. A lot of innovation happening here. Of course, Dearborn is also today, because it's such a big, influential, important, significant community, <laughs> a well-known community, it attracts a lot of detractors. Of course, we all know that Terry Jones came here to burn the Quran, and instead he shot himself in the foot. I think I, I'm probably not the only person who enjoyed observing that. Unfortunately, these guys who carry the pig's head, a literal pig's head around the East, the, the East Dearborn Festival, have canceled the festival. The city won't do the festival anymore because they can't afford to insure it anymore. So the city continues to attract these detractors. Um, but the city also has a lot of supporters. So this is the interfaith meeting that took place uh, before Terry Jones came to town. People were really worried that the Shabab in Dearborn were going to like stone Terry Jones to death or create a riot or something like that. I was like, this isn't Afghanistan. These are, this is Dearborn. But still, it was, a, it was a really powerful moment to see all these religious leaders from throughout. The, I remember when I drove, I was at this event, when I drove up, I actually started crying. I called my husband on the phone and started crying because it was all non-Arabs going into the mosque. You know, usually I'm the only non-Arab going into the Islamic Center of America, or one of the you know, few. Here I was like with everybody else. I, I just was very moved. Here everyone is standing outside in front of the mosque, showing their interfaith solidarity. And we also had more recently, in the current political climate we're in with the, with the travel ban that's being, you know, well, it looks like the Supreme Court is actually going to uphold. It doesn't affect Lebanon. It does affect Syria. It does affect Yemen. It affects this community in many, many, many ways. The Arab community went out to the airport to protest. And I'll tell you, because I've been to, I don't know how many protests here in Dearborn, where again, I'm like the only non-Arab at the protest. This was Arabs were in the minority. America has come to recognize that when your rights are threatened, their rights are threatened. America, the liberal part of America, the, the part of America I identify with, has come to identify with you and to recognize that you're as American as we are. That's why all these people came out to the airport. So it really was, to me, it was just a beautiful moment. In, even in this, you know, the, the, the how sad we all felt after the election and after the travel ban was like the first thing the new president did. But I also like this picture because it takes me back to the roots of this community. This community is not just any Arab community. It's a Muslim Arab community. And so many of the tensions and problems the community has faced over the years and so many of the things that have strengthened and enriched and empowered the community over the years come from Islam. So I like this because this shows here are these you know, regular old Americans at the airport during the protest put their signs down on the ground and made a prayer rug, made the ground allow for the Muslims who were there to be able to pray. So this, in answer to your question about my next book, is this is what I mean by a halal metropolis. It's a, it's a space where Muslims are visible, where Muslims are empowered, uh, and where Muslims are transforming the landscape, really transforming it in cultural ways, in political ways, and social ways. So that's my talk. Thank you. I'm sorry I went over my time. Do you want to thank Sally for this? Uh, if, if there's anybody, any questions or anyone would like to say something to. Yes. Muslim that uh, uh, Yemen uh, uh, workers uh, bring their Mr. Ford. He go to Yemen by big ship like Titanic and bring about uh, 3,000 workers. What uh, 
true about this anymore. So I hear this too. <laughs> I've heard this story many times. I have friends who tell the story. And as a historian, I have to say, I have looked and looked and looked for the evidence. I have not seen any written evidence. I have not talked to anyone who says their father was on that ship. Um, I think that we have, I think that there were Yemenis who came here. The Yemeni community and the Bangladeshi community had in common their experience with the British. They were colonized by the British. And a lot of them worked as merchant marines in the British Navy. So they worked in the coal rooms of the, of the ships. They, they shoveled the coals. The British were like a lot of the American entrepreneurs were in this period, like Henry Ford used to put the black people within the hot part of the factory, or put the Yemenis in the hot part of the factory because he thought dark skinned men, you could do that kind of work. So the British put the Yemenis and the Bangladeshis in the boiler rooms of their ships. And a lot of these men, when they got to America, when they got to New Orleans or Baltimore or, or New York, they would jump ship and they would come to America. And a lot of the Bangladeshis who came to Detroit in this period were in that category. But I know the grandchildren of those men. I mean, there's like a record of those men coming here. I don't see a record of Yemenis being here in that period. Now, there are people who would contradict me, but I just have, personally, I haven't seen the evidence from it. I know the Yemenis were here in the 40s. And even in the 1930s, they started coming here. There was a mosque in New York in 1930 that was mostly a Yemeni mosque. And a lot of those Yemenis came and did work, like Joe Barajo's father was from that community. So see, I can associate one man with a mosque, but a lot of the, the, the other stories, I have not, honestly, I haven't seen that else. Yes? Yeah, I'm just curious, do you know what's the name? Thank you, Dr. Sally, appreciate it. I just want to let you know that uh, she has a witness here. I came to this country in 1955, and I witnessed most what this history is all about. I remember the mosque in Hallam Park. I remember when they built the mosque, which is now used by the Yemenis in Andix Avenue, American Society, American